Section 37 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 37. Selected Poems by Arthur Hugh Clough. There is no God. There is no God, saith the wicked, and truly it's a blessing, for what he might have done with us is better only guessing. There is no God, a youngster thinks, or really if there may be. He surely didn't mean a man, always to be a baby. There is no God, or if there is, the tradesman thinks, twere funny, if he should take it ill in me to make a little money. Whether there be the rich man says it matters very little for i and mine thank somebody are not in vain of victual some others also to themselves who scarce so much as doubt it think there is none when they are well and do not think about it but country folks who live beneath the shadow of the steeple the parson and the parson's wife are mostly married people the youths green and happy in first love so thankful for illusion a man caught out in what the world calls guilt in first confusion and almost every one when age disease or sorrow strike him inclines to think that there is a god or something very like him the latest d catalogue thou shalt have one god only who would be at the expense of two no graven images may be worshipped save in the currency swear not at all since for thy curse thine enemy is none the worse at church on sunday to attend will serve to keep the world thy friend honour thy parents that is all from whom advancement may befall thou shalt not kill but needest not strife efficaciously to keep alive adultery is not fit or safe for women to commit thou shalt not steal an empty feet when tis as lucrative to cheat bear not false witness let the lie have time on its own wings to fly thou shalt not covet but tradition approves all forms of competition to the unknown god o thou whose image in the shrine of human spirits dwells divine which from that precinct once conveyed to be to outer day displayed doth vanish part and leave behind mere blank and void of empty mind which wilful fancy seeks in vain with casual shapes to fill again o thou that in our bosom's shrine dost dwell unknown because divine i thought to speak i thought to say the light is here behold the way the voice was thus and thus the word and thus i saw and that i heard and from the lips that half essayed the imperfect utterance fell unmade o thou in that mysterious shrine enthroned as i must say divine i will not frame one thought of what thou mayest either be or not i will not prate of thus and so and be profane with yes and no enough that in our stolen heart thou whatsoever thou mayst be art unseen secure in that high shrine acknowledged present and divine i will not ask some upper air some future day to place thee there nor say nor yet deny such men and women say thee thus and then thy name was such and there or here to him or her thou didst appear do only thou in that dim shrine unknown or known remain divine there or if not at least in eyes that scan the fact that round them lies the hand to sway the judgment guide and in sight and sense thyself divide be thou but there in soul and heart will not ask to feel thy art easter day naples eighteen forty nine through the great sinful streets of naples as i passed with fiercer heat than flamed above my head my heart was hot within me till at last my brain was lightened when my tongue had said christ is not risen christ is not risen no he lies and moulders lo christ is not risen what though the stone were rolled away and though the grave found empty there if not there then elsewhere if not where joseph laid him first why then were other men translated him after in some humbler clay long ere to-day corruption that sad perfect work hath done which here she scarcely lightly had begun the foul engendered worm feeds on the flesh of the life-giving form of our most holy and anointed one he is not risen no he lies and moulders low christ is not risen what if the women or the dawn was grey saw one or more great angels as they say angels or him himself yet neither there nor then nor afterwards nor elsewhere nor at all 
hath he appeared to peter or the tame nor save in thunderous terror to blind paul save in an after gospel and late creed he is not risen indeed christ is not risen or what if e'en as runs a tale the ten saw heard and touched again and yet again what if at emesis inn and by capernaum's lake came one the bread that break came one that spake as never mortal spake and with them ate and drank and stood and walked about ah some did well to doubt ah the true christ while these things came to pass nor heard nor spake nor walked nor lived alas he is not risen no he lay and mouldered lo christ was not risen as circulates in some great city crowd i murmur changeful vague importunate and loud from no determined centre or of fact or authorship exact which no man can deny nor verify so spread the wondrous frame he all the same lay senseless mouldering low he is not risen no christ was not risen ashes to ashes dust to dust as of the unjust also of the just yea of that just one too this is the one sad gospel that is true christ is not risen he is not risen and shall we not rise o oh, we unwise what did we dream what wake we to discover ye hills fall on us and ye mountains cover in darkness and great gloom come ere we thought it is our day of doom from the cursed world which is one tomb christ is not risen eat drink and play and think that this is bliss there is no heaven but this there is no hell save earth which deserves the purpose doubly well seeing it visits still with equalist apportionment of ill both good and bad alike and brings to one same dust the unjust and the just with christ who is not risen eat drink and die for we are souls bereaved of all the creatures under heaven's wide cope we are most hopeless who had once most hope and most beliefless that had most believed ashes to ashes dust to dust as of the unjust also of the just yea of that just one too it is the one sad gospel that is true christ is not risen weep not beside the tomb ye women unto whom he was great solace while ye tended him ye who with napkin o'er the head and folds of linen round each wounded limb laid out the sacred dead and thou that bearest him in thy wandering womb yea daughters of jerusalem depart bind up as best ye may your own sad bleeding heart go to your homes your living children tend your earthly spouses love yet your affections not on things above which moth and rust corrupt which quickliest come to end or pray if pray ye must and pray if pray ye can for death instead is he whom ye deemed more than man who is not risen no but lies in moulders low who is not risen ye men of galilee why stand ye looking up to heaven where him ye ne'er may see neither ascending hence nor returning hither again ye ignorant and idle fishermen hence to your huts and boats and inland native shores and catch not men but fish what e'er things ye might wish him neither here nor there ye e'er shall meet with more ye poor deluded youths go home mend the old nets ye left to roam tie the split oar patch the torn sail it was indeed an idle tale he was not risen and o oh, good men of ages yet to be who shall believe because ye did not see o oh, be ye warned be wise no more with pleading eyes and sobs strong desire unto the empty vacant void aspire seeking another and impossible birth that is not of your own and only mother earth but if there is no other life for you sit down and be content since this must even do he is not risen one look and then depart ye humble and ye holy men of heart and ye ye ministers and stewards of a word which ye would preach because another heard ye worshippers of that ye do not know take these things hence and go he is not risen here on our easter day we rise we come and lo we find him not gardener not other on the sacred spot where they have laid him there is none to say no sound nor in nor out no word of where to seek the dead or meet the living lord there is no glistering of an angel's wings there is no voice of heavenly clear behest let us go hence and think upon these things in silence which is best is he not risen no but lies in moulders low christ is not risen it fortifies my soul to know it fortifies my soul to know that though i perish truth is so that howsoever i stray in range what error i do 
thou dost not change. I steadier step when I recall that if I slip thou dost not fall. Say not the struggle not availeth. Say not the struggle not availeth. The labour and the wounds are vain. The enemy faints not nor faileth. And as things have been they remain. If hopes were dupes, fears may be liars. It may be in yon smoke concealed. Your comrades chase e'en now the flyers. But for you possess the field. For while the tired waves vainly breaking Seem here no painful inch to gain. Far back, three creeks and inlets making, Comes silent, flooding in the main. And not by eastern windows only, When daylight comes, comes in the light. In front, the sun climbs slow, how slowly, But westward, look, the land is bright. Come back, come back, come back, Behold with straining mast and swelling sail, Behold her steaming fast, With one new sun to see her voyage o'er, With morning light to touch her native shore. Come back, come back. Come back, come back, while westward labouring by, With sailish yards, a bare black hulk we fly, See how the gale we fight with sweeps her back, To our lost home, on our forsaken track, Come back, come back, come back, come back, Across the flying foam, We hear faint far-off voices call us home, Come back, ye seem to say, ye seek in vain, We went, we sought, and homeward turned again, Come back, come back, come back, come back, And whither back, or why? To fan quenched hopes, forsaken schemes to try. Walk the old fields, pace the familiar street. Dream with the idlers, with the bards compete. Come back, come back. Come back, come back, and whither, and for what? To finger idly some old Gordian knot, Unskilled to sunder, and too weak to cleave. And with much toil attain, to half believe. Come back, come back. Come back, come back. Yea, back indeed do go. Sighs panting, thick, and tears that want to flow fond fluttering hopes uprise their useless wings and wishes idly struggle in the strings come back come back come back come back more eager than the breeze the flying fancies sweep across the seas and lighter far than ocean's flying foam the heart's fond message hurries to its home come back come back come back come back back flies the foam the hoisted flag streams back the long smoke wavers on the homeward track. Back fly with winds things which the wind obey. The strong ship follows its appointed way. As ships be calmed. As ships be calmed at eve, That lay with canvas dripping side by side, Two towers of sail at dawn of day, Are scarce long leagues apart descried. When fell the night, up sprang the breeze, And all the darkling hours they plied, Not dreamt but each the self-same seas, by each was clearing side by side. E'en so, but why the tale reveal Of those whom year by year unchanged, Brief absence joined anew to feel, Astound, soul from soul estranged, At dead of night their sails were filled, And onward each rejoicing stared. Ah, neither blame, for neither willed, Or wist what first with dawn appeared, To veer how vain, on onward strain, Brave barks in light and darkness too, through winds and tides one compass guides, To that and your own selves be true. But, O blithe breeze, and O great seas, Though ne'er that earliest parting past, On your wide plain they join again, Together lead them home at last. One port methought alike they sought, One purpose hold, where'er they fare, O binding breeze, O rushing seas, At last, at last, unite them there. The Unknown Course where lies the land to which the ship would go? Far, far ahead is all her seamen know, And where the land she travels from. Away, far, far behind is all that they can say. O oh, sunny noons upon the deck's smooth face, Linked arm in arm, how pleasant here to pace. Or o'er the stern reclining watch below, The foaming wake far, widening as we go. On stormy nights, when wild north-westers rave, how proud a thing to fight with wind and wave! The dripping sailor on the reeling mast Exults to bear and scorns to wish it past. Where lies the land to which the ship would go? Far, far ahead is all her seamen know. And where the land she travels from, Away, far, far behind, is all they can say. The gondola, afloat, we move, delicious. Ah, what else is like the gondola? This level flow of liquid glass Begins beneath us swift to pass. 
it goes as though it went alone by some impulsion of its own how light it moves how softly ah were all things like the gondola how light it moves how softly ah could life as does our gondola unvexed with quarrels aims and cares our moral duties and affairs unswaying noiseless swift and strong for ever thus thus glide along how light we move how softly ah were life but as the gondola with no more motion than should bear a freshness to the languid air with no more effort than expressed the need and naturalness of rest which we beneath our grateful shade should take on peaceful pillows laid how light we move how softly ah were life but as the gondola in one unbroken passage borne to closing night from opening morn uplift at whiles slow eyes to mark some palace front some passing bark three windows catch the varying shore and hear the soft turns of the oar how light we move how softly ah were life but as the gondola the poet's place in life come poet come a thousand labourers ply their task and what it tends to scarcely ask and trembling thinkers on the brink shiver and know not what to think to tell the purport of their pain and what our silly joys contain in lasting lineaments portray the substance of the shadowy day our real and inner deeds rehearse and make our meaning clear in verse come poet come for but in vain we do the work or feel the pain and gather up the evening gain unless before the end thou come to take ere they are lost their sum come poet come to give an utterance to the dumb and make vain babblers silent come a thousand gyps point here and there bewildered by the show and glare and wise men half have learnt to doubt whether we are not best without come poet both but wait to see their error proved to them in thee come poet come in vain i seem to call and yet think not the living times forget ages of heroes fought and fell that homer in the end might tell o'er grovelling generations past up stood the doric fane at last and countless hearts and countless years had wasted thoughts and hopes and fears rude laughter and unmeaning tears ere england shakespeare saw or rome the pure perfection of her dome others i doubt not if not we the issue of our toils shall see young children gather as their own the harvest that the dead had sown the dead forgotten and unknown on keeping within one's proper sphere from the booth of tuber na Vulich, a party of oxford men spend their long vacation in scotland in due course they return to their colleges adam one of the party the grave man nicknamed adam white tied clerical silent and antique square cut waistcoat receives a letter at christmas from philip hewson the chartist the poet the eloquent speaker what i said at ballock has truth in it only distorted plants are some for fruit and some for flowering only let there be deer in parks as well as kine in paddocks grecian buildings upon the earth as well as gothic there may be men perhaps whose vocation it is to be idle idle sumptuous even luxurious if it must be only let each man seek to be that for which nature meant him independent surely of pleasure if not regardless independent also of station if not regardless irrespective also of station as of enjoyment do his duty in that state of life to which god not man shall call him if you were meant to plough lord marcus out with you and do it if you were meant to be idle o beggar behold i will feed thee take my purse you have far better right to it friend than the marcus if you were born for a groom and you seem by your dress to believe so do it like a man sir george for pay in a livery stable yes you may so release that slip of a boy at the corner fingering books at the window misdoubting the eighth commandment what a mere dean with whose wits that debtor and creditor headpiece go my detective dd make the place of burns brigadier ah fair lady maria god meant you to live and to be lovely be so then and i bless you but ye is spurious where you might be plain woman and can be by no possibility better ye unhappy statuettes ye miserable trinkets poor alabaster chimney piece ornaments under glass cases come in god's name come down the very french clock by you puts you to shame with ticking the fire irons deride you break your glasses ye can 
come down ye are not really plaster come in god's name come down do anything be but something you young girl who have had such advantages learnt so quickly can you not teach oh yes and she likes sunday school extremely only it's soon in the morning away if to teach be your calling it is no play but a business off go teach and be paid for it surely that fussy old dowager yonder was meant for the counter only she is notable at berry and keeps her servants in order past admiration indeed and keeps to employ her talent how many pray to what use away the hotel's her vocation lady sophie's so good to the sick so firm and so gentle is there a nobler sphere than of hospital nurse a matron hast thou for cooking a turn little lady clarissa in with them in with your fingers their beauty it spoils but your own it enhances for it is beautiful only to do the thing we are meant for but they will marry have husbands and children and guests and households are there so many trades for a man for women one only first to look out for a husband and then to preside at his table have you ever philip my boy looked at it in this way when the armies are set in array and the battle beginning is it well that the soldier whose post is far to the leftward say i will go to the right it is there i shall do best service there is a great field marshal my friend who arrays our battalions let us to providence trust and abide and work in our stations consider it again old things need not be therefore true o brother men nor yet the new ah still awhile the old thought retain and yet consider it again the souls of now two thousand years have laid up here their toils and fears and all the yearnings of their pain ah yet consider it again we what do you see each a space of some few yards before his face does that the whole wide plan explain ah yet consider it again alas the great world goes its way and takes its truth from each new day they do not quit nor yet retain far less consider it again end of section thirty seven section thirty eight library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by rita boutros library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine Section 38 Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772-1834 to 1834, by George E. Woodbury Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the English poet and philosopher, was born at Ottery St. Mary in Devonshire, October 21, 1772. He was the ninth and youngest son of the vicar of the parish, a man characterized by learning and also by some of its foibles under whose care he passed his childhood but on the death of his father he was sent up to london to be educated at christ's hospital and there spent in companionship with lamb his school days from seventeen eighty two to seventeen ninety one he went in the latter year to jesus college cambridge his career as an undergraduate was marked by an escapade his enlistment in the king's regiment of light dragoons in the winter of seventeen ninety three to ninety four from which he was released by the influence of his relatives and in more important ways by his friendship with southey whom he found on a visit to oxford and his engagement to sarah fricker in the summer of seventeen ninety four he had already been attached to another young lady mary evans with whose family he had been intimate in december seventeen ninety four he left cambridge without taking a degree and on october twenty first seventeen ninety five he was married his biography from this point is one of confused and intricate detail, which only a long story could set forth plainly and exactly. 
Its leading external events were a residence in Germany in 1798-99, to and a voyage to Malta, with travel in Sicily and Italy, in 1804-6. to In its inward development, the turning points of his life were his first intimacy with the Wordsworths in 1797, during which his best poems were composed. His subjection to the opium habit, with increasing domestic unhappiness, in 1801-2. to and his retreat under medical control to Highgate in 1816. He was practically separated from his family from the time of his voyage to Malta. Troubles of many kinds filled all these years, but he had always a power to attract friends who were deeply interested in his welfare, and he was never without admirers and helpers. Before he withdrew to Highgate, he had resided first at Stowey in the neighborhood of Tom Pool, and later at Greta Hall near the Wordsworths. But he was often away from home, and after he ceased to be an inmate there, from 1806 to 1816, he led a wandering life, either in lodgings frequently changed, or in visits to his friends. His resources were always small, and from the start his friends were his patrons, making up subscriptions, loans, and gifts for him. In 1798 the Wedgwoods gave him a pension of a hundred and fifty pounds for life, which was soon secured for the support of his family, and in 1812 one half of this was withdrawn. In 1825 he was granted a royal pension of 100 guineas, and when this lapsed in 1830, Frere made it up to him. De Quincey had distinguished himself by an act of singular and impulsive generosity to him upon first acquaintance. He was always cared for, though his indulgence in opium made it difficult for those who knew the fact to assist him directly in a wise way. His pecuniary embarrassment, however, was constant and trying during a great part of his life. His own wretchedness of spirit, under the painful conditions of his bodily state, and his moral as well as material position, was very great but through all these sufferings and trials he maintained sufficient energy to leave behind him a considerable body of literary work. He died July twenty fifth, 1834. The poetic genius of Coleridge, the highest of his many gifts, found brilliant and fascinating expression. His poems, those in which his fame lives, are as unique as they are memorable, and, though their small number, their confined range, and the brief period during which his faculty was exercised with full freedom and power, seem to indicate a narrow vein. Yet the remainder of his work in prose and verse leaves an impression of extraordinary and abundant intellectual force in proportion as his imaginative creations stand apart the spirit out of which they came must have possessed some singularity and if the reader is not content with simple aesthetic appreciation of what the gods provide but has some touch of curiosity leading him to look into the source of such remarkable achievement and its human history he is at once interested in the personality of the subtle-souled psychologist, as Shelley, with his accurate critical insight, first named him. In experiencing the fascination of the poetry, one remembers the charm which Coleridge had in life, that quality which arrested attention in all companies and drew men's minds and hearts with a sense of something marvellous in him. The most wonderful man, said Wordsworth, that I ever met. The mind and heart of Coleridge, his whole life, have been laid open by himself and his friends and acquaintances, without reserve in many volumes of letters and memoirs. 
it is easy to figure him as he lived, and to recover his moods and aspect. But in order to conceive his nature and define its traits, it is necessary to take account especially of his incomplete and less perfect work, of his miscellaneous interests, and those activities which filled and confused his life without having any important share in establishing his fame. The intellectual precocity, which is the leading trait of Coleridge's boyhood, in the familiar portrait of the inspired charity boy, drawn by Lamb from schoolboy memories, is not unusual in a youth of genius, but the omnivorousness of knowledge which he then displayed continued into his manhood. He consumed vast quantities of book-learning. It is a more remarkable characteristic that from the earliest period in which he comes into clear view, he was accustomed to give out his ideas with freedom in an inexhaustible stream of talk. The activity of his mind was as phenomenal as its receptivity. In his college days, too, he was fanatical in all his energies. The remark of Southey, after Shelley's visit to him, that here was a young man who was just what he himself had been in his college days, is illustrative. For if Southey was then inflamed with radicalism, Coleridge was yet more deeply infected and mastered by that wild fever of the revolutionary dawn. The tumult of Coleridge's mind, its incessant action, the lack of discipline in his thought, of restraint in his expression, of judgment in his affairs, are all important elements in his character, at a time which in most men would be called the formative period of manhood, but which in him seems to have been intensely chaotic. What is most notable, however, is the volume of his mental energy. He expressed himself, too, in ways natural to such self-abundance. He was always a discourser, if the name may be used, from the London days at the Salutation and the Cat, of which Lamb tells, saying that the landlord was ready to retain him because of the attraction of his conversation for customers and, as he went on to the more set forms of such monologue, he became a preacher without pay in Unitarian chapels, a journalist with unusual capacity for ready and sonorous writing in the press, a composer of whole periodicals such as his ventures, The Watchman and The Friend, and a lecturer using only slight notes as the material of his remarks upon literature, education, philosophy, theology, or whatever the subject might be. In all these methods of expression, which he took up one after the other, he merely talked in an ample way upon multifarious topics, in the conversation, sermon, leading article, written discourse, or flowing address, he was master of a swelling and often brilliant volubility. But he had neither the certainty of the orator, nor the unfailing distinction of the author. There was an occasional and impromptu quality, a colloquial and episodical manner, the style of the irresponsible speaker. In his earlier days, especially, the dominant note in Coleridge's whole nature was excitement. He was always animated. He was often violent. He was always without the principle of control. Indeed, a weakness of moral power seems to have been congenital, in the sense that he was not permanently bound by a practical sense of duty, nor apparently observant of what place duty has in real life. There was misdirection of his affairs from the time when they came into his own hands. There was impulsiveness, thoughtlessness, a lack of judgment which augured ill for him. And in its total effect this amounted to folly. 
his intoxication with the scheme known as panticocracy by which he with southey and a few like-minded projectors were to found a socialistic community on the banks of the susquehanna is the most obvious comment on his practical sense but his marriage with the anecdotes of its preliminaries one of which was that in those colloquies with lamb at the london tavern so charmingly described by his boon companion he had forgotten his engagement or was indifferent to it more strikingly exemplifies the irresponsible course of his life more particularly as it proved to be ill-sorted full of petty difficulties and makeshift expedients and in the end a disastrous failure a radical social scheme and an imprudent marriage might have fallen to his share of human folly however without exciting remark if in other ways or at a later time he had exhibited the qualities which would allow one to dismiss these matters as mere instances of immaturity but wherever coleridge's reasonable control over himself or his affairs is looked to it appears to have been feeble on the other hand the constancy of his excitement is plain it was not only mental but physical he was as a young man full of energy and capable of a good deal of hard exercise he had animal spirits, and Wordsworth describes him as noisy and gamesome, as one who his limbs would toss about him with delight, like branches when strong winds the trees annoy. And from several passages of his own writing, which are usually disregarded, the evidence of a spirit of rough humor and fun is easily obtained. The truth is that Coleridge changed a great deal in his life. He felt himself to be very different in later years from what he was in the time when, to his memory, even he was a sort of glorified spirit. And this earlier Coleridge had many traits which are ignored sometimes, as Carlyle ignored them, and are sometimes remembered rather as idealizations of his friends in their affectionate thoughts of him but in any event are irreconcilable with the figure of the last period of his life it has been suggested that there was something of disease or at least of ill health in coleridge always and that it should be regarded as influencing his temperament whether it were so or not the plea itself shows the fact if excitement was the dominant note as has been said in his whole nature it could not exist without a physical basis and accompaniment and his bodily state appears to have been often less one of animation than of agitation and his correspondence frequently discloses moods that seem almost frantic in the issue under stress of pain and trouble he became an opium eater but his physical nature may fairly be described as predisposed to such states as lead to the use of opium and also result from its use with the attendant mental moods his susceptibility to sensuous impressions to a voluptuousness of the entire being together with a certain lassitude and languor lead to the same conclusion which thus seems to be supported on all sides that coleridge was in his youth and early manhood fevered through all his intellectual and sensuous nature and deficient on the moral and practical sides in those matters that related to his personal affairs it is desirable to bring this out in plain terms because in coleridge it is best to acknowledge at once that his character was so far as our part the world's part in him is concerned of less consequence than his temperament a subtler and more profound thing than character though without moral meaning 
It is not unfair to say, since literature is to be regarded most profitably as the expression of human personality, that with Coleridge the modern literature of temperament, as it has been lately recognized in extreme phases, begins. Not that temperament is a new thing in the century now closing, nor that it has been without influence hitherto, but that now it is more often considered, and has in fact more often been, an exclusive ground of artistic expression. The temperament of Coleridge was one of diffused sensuousness physically, and of abnormal mental moods. Moods of weakness, languor, collapse, a visionary imaginative life with a night atmosphere of the spectral, moonlit, swimming, scarcely substantial world, and the poems he wrote, which are the contributions he made to the world's literature, are based on this temperament, like some fata morgana upon the sea. The apparent exclusion of reality from the poems in which his genius was most manifest finds its analogue in the detachment of his own mind from the moral, the practical, the usual in life as he led it in his spirit. And his work of the highest creative sort, which is all there is to his enduring fame, stands amid his prose and verse composition of a lower sort, like an island in the waste of waters. This may be best shown, perhaps, by a gradual approach through his cruder to his more perfect compositions. The cardinal fact in Coleridge's genius is that, notwithstanding his immense sensuous susceptibilities and mental receptivity, and the continual excitement of his spirit, he never rose into the highest sphere of creative activity except for the brief period called his Annus Mirabilis, when his great poems were written and with this is the further related fact that in him we witness the spectacle of the imaginative instinct overborne and supplanted by the intellectual faculty exercising its speculative and critical functions and in addition one observes in his entire work an extraordinary inequality not only of treatment but also of subject matter in general, he was an egoistic writer. His sensitiveness to nature was twofold. In the first place, he noticed in the objects and movements of nature evanescent and minute details, and as his sense of beauty was keen, he saw and recorded truly the less obvious and less common loveliness in the phenomena of the elements and the seasons and this gave distinction to his mere description and record of fact in the second place he often felt in himself moods induced by nature but yet subjective states of his own spirit which sometimes deepened the charm of night for example by his enjoyment of its placid aspects and sometimes imparted to the external world a despair reflected from his personal melancholy. In his direct treatment of nature, however, as Mr. Stopford Brooke points out, he seldom achieves more than a catalogue of his sensations, which, though touched with imaginative detail, are never lifted and harmonized into lyrical unity though he can moralize nature in wordsworth's fashion when he does so the result remains wordsworth's and is stamped with that poet's originality and in his own original work coleridge never equalled either the genius of shelley who can identify nature with himself or the charm of tennyson who can at least parallel nature's phenomena with his own human moods Coleridge would not be thought of as a poet of nature, except in so far as he describes what he observes in the way of record, or gives a metaphysical interpretation to phenomena. 
this is the more remarkable because he had to an eminent degree that intellectual power that overmastering desire of the mind to rationalize the facts of life it was this quality that made him a philosopher an analyst a critic on the great lines of aristotle seeking to impose an order of ethics and metaphysics on all artistic productions but in those poems in which he describes nature directly and without metaphysical thought there is no trace of anything more than a sensuous order of his own perceptions beautiful and often unique as his nature poems are they are not creative they are rather in the main autobiographic and it is surprising to notice how large a proportion of his verse is thus autobiographic not in those phases of his own life which may be or at least are thought of as representative of human life in the mass but which are personal such as the lines written after hearing wordsworth read the prelude or those entitled dejection when his verse is not confined to autobiographic expression it is often a product of his interest in his friends or in his family what is not personal in it of this sort is apt to be domestic or social if we turn from the poems of nature to those concerned with man a similar shallowness either of interest or of power appears he was in early years a radical he was stirred by the revolution in france and he was emotionally charged with the ideas of the time ideas of equality fraternity and liberty but this interest died out as is shown by his political verse he had none but a social and a philosophical interest in any case man the individual did not at any time attract him there was nothing dramatic in his genius in the narrow and exact sense he did not engage his curiosity or his philosophy in individual fortunes it results from this limitation that his verse lacks a human interest of the dramatic kind the truth was that he was interested in thought rather than in deeds in human nature rather than in its concrete pity and terror thus he did not seize on life itself as the material of his imagination and reflection in the case of man as in the case of nature he gives us only an egoistic account telling us of his own private fortune his fears pains and despairs but only as a diary gives them as he did not transfer his nature impressions into the world of creative art so he did not transfer his personal experiences into that world what has been said would perhaps be accepted were it not for the existence of those poems the ancient mariner christabel kubla khan which are the marvellous creations of his genius in these it will be said there is both a world of nature new created and a dramatic method and interest it is enough for the purpose of the analysis if it be granted that nowhere else in coleridge's work except in these and less noticeably in a few other instances do these high characteristics occur the very point which is here to be brought out is that coleridge applied that intellectual power that overmastering desire of the mind to rationalize the phenomena of life which has been mentioned as his great mental trait that he applied this faculty with different degrees of power at different times so that his poetry falls naturally into higher and inferior categories in the autobiographic verse in the political and dramatic verse which forms so large a part of his work it appears that he did not have sufficient feeling or exercise sufficient power to raise it out of the lower levels of composition 
in his great works of constructive and impersonal art of moral intensity or romantic beauty and fascination he did so exercise the creative imagination as to make these of the highest rank or at least one of them the ancient mariner apart from its many minor merits has this distinction in coleridge's work it is a poem of perfect unity christabel is a fragment kubla khan is a glimpse and though the ode to france love youth and age and possibly a few other short pieces have this highest artistic virtue of unity yet in them it is of a simpler kind the ancient mariner on the other hand is a marvel of construction in that its unity is less complex than manifold it exists however the form be examined in the merely external sense the telling of the tale to the wedding guest with the fact that the wedding is going on gives it unity in the merely internal sense the moral lesson of the salvation of the slayer of the albatross by the medium of love felt toward living things subtly yet lucidly worked out as the notion is gives it unity but in still other ways as a story of connected and consequential incidents with a plot a change of fortune a climax and the other essentials of this species of tale-telling it has unity and if its conception either of the physical or the ethical world be analyzed these two and these are the fundamental things are found consistent wholes it nevertheless remains true that this system of nature as a vitalized but not humanized mode of life with its bird its spirit its magical powers is not the nature that we know or believe to be it is a modern presentation of an essentially primitive and animistic belief and similarly this system of human life if the word human can be applied to it with its dead men its skeleton ship its spirit sailors its whole miracle of spectral being is not the life we know or believe to be it is an incantation a simulacrum it may still be true therefore that the imaginative faculty of coleridge was not applied either to nature or human life in the ordinary sense and this it is that constitutes the uniqueness of the poem and its wonderful fascination coleridge fell heir by the accidents of time and the revolutions of taste to the ballad style its simplicity directness and narrative power he also was most attracted to the machinery of the supernatural the weird the terrible almost to the grotesque and horrid as these literary motives came into fashion in the crude beginnings of romanticism in our time his subtle mind his fine senses his peculiar susceptibility to the mystic and shadowy in nature as shown by his preference of the moonlight dreamy or night aspects of real nature to its brilliant beauties in the waking world gave him ease and finesse in the handling of such subject matter and he lived late enough to know that all this eerie side of human experience and imaginative capacity inherited from primeval ages but by no means yet deprived of plausibility could be effectively used only as an allegoric or scenic setting of what should be truth to the ethical sense he combined one of the highest lessons of advanced civilization one of the last results of spiritual perception the idea of love toward life in any form with the animistic beliefs and supernatural fancies of the crude ages of the senses this seems to be the substantial matter and in this he was to repeat shelley's phrase the subtle-souled psychologist 
The material of his imagination on the sensuous side was of the slightest. It was the supernaturalism of the romantic movement, somewhat modified by being placed in connection with the animal world, and he put this to use as a means of illustrating spiritual truth. He thus became the first of those who have employed the supernatural in our recent literature without losing credence for it, as an allegory of psychological states, moral facts, or illusions real to the eye that sees them and having some logical relation to the past of the individual. Of such writers, Hawthorne and Poe are eminent examples, and both of them, it may be remarked, are writers in whom temperament rather than character is the ground of their creative work. The intimate kinship between imagination so directed and the speculative philosophical temper is plain to see. In Christabel, on the other hand, the moral substance is not apparent. The place filled by the moral ideas which are the centers of the narrative in the ancient mariner is taken here by emotional situations, but the supernaturalism is practically the same in both poems, and in both is associated with that mystery of the animal world to man, most concentrated and vivid in the fascination ascribed traditionally to the snake which is the animal motive in Christabel, as the goodness of the albatross in the ancient mariner. In these poems, the good and the bad omens that ancient augurs minded are made again dominant over men's imagination. Such are the signal and unique elements in these poems, which have, besides that wealth of beauty in detail, of fine diction, of liquid melody, of sentiment, thought, and image, which belong only to poetry of the highest order, and which are too obvious to require any comment. Kubla Khan is a poem of the same kind, in which the mystical effect is given almost wholly by landscape. It is to the ancient mariner and Christabel what protoplasm is to highly organized cells. If it be recognized then that the imagery of Coleridge in the characteristic parts of these cardinal poems is as pure allegory, is as remote from nature or man, as is the machinery of fairyland and chivalry in Spencer, for example. And he obtains credibility by the psychological and ethical truth presented in this imagery. It is not surprising that his work is small in amount, for the method is not only a difficult one, but the poetic machinery itself is limited and meager. The poverty of the subject matter is manifest, and the restrictions to its successful use are soon felt. It may well be doubted whether Christabel would have gained by being finished. In the ancient mariner, the isolation of the man is a great advantage. If there had been any companion for him, the illusion could not have been entire. As it is, what he experiences has the wholeness and truth within itself of a dream or of a madman's world, where there is no standard of appeal outside of his own senses and mind. No real world. But in Christabel, the serpentine fable goes on in a world of fact and action, and as soon as the course of the story involved this fable in the probabilities and actual occurrences of life, it might well be that the tale would have turned into one of simple enchantment and magic, as seems likely from what has been told of its continuation. Certainly it could not have equaled the earlier poem, or have been in the same kind with it, unless the unearthly magic, the spell, were finally completely dissolved into the world of moral truth, as is the case with the ancient mariner. Coleridge found it still more impossible to continue Kubla Khan. It seems a fair inference to conclude that Coleridge's genius 
however it suffered from the misfortunes and ills of his life, was in these works involved in a field, however congenial, yet of narrow range and infertile in itself. In poetic style it is to be observed that he kept what he had gained. The turbid diction of the earlier period never came back to trouble him, and the cadences he had formed still gave their music to his verse. The change, the decline, was not in his power of style. It was in his power of imagination, if at all. But the fault may have laid in the capacities of the subject matter. A similar thing certainly happened in his briefer ballad poetry, in that of which Love, the Three Graces, Alice Duclos, and the Dark Lady are examples. The matter there, the machinery of the romantic ballad, was no longer capable of use. That sort of literature was dead from the exhaustion of its motives. The great ode to France, in which he reached his highest point of eloquent and passionate expression, seems to mark the extinction in himself of the revolutionary impulse. On the whole, while the excellence of much of the remainder of his verse, even in later years, is acknowledged, and its originality in several instances, may it not be that in his greatest work Coleridge came to an end because of an impossibility in the kind itself? The supernatural is an accessory rather than a main element in the interpretation of life which literary genius undertakes. Coleridge so subordinates it here by making it contributory to a moral truth but such a practice would seem to be necessarily incidental to a poet who was also so intellectual as Coleridge, and not to be adopted as a permanent method of self-expression. From whatever cause, the fact was that Coleridge ceased to create in poetry, and fell back on that fluent, manifold, voluminous faculty he possessed of absorbing and giving out ideas in vast quantities, as it were, by bulk. He attended especially to the theory of art, as he found it illustrated in the greatest poets, and he popularized among literary men a certain body of doctrine regarding criticism, its growth and methods and in later years he worked out metaphysical theological views which he inculcated in ways which won for him recognition as a practical influence in contemporary church opinion. In these last years of his lecturing and discoursing in private, the figure he makes is pathetic, though Carlyle describes it with a grim humor, as anyone may read in the life of Sterling, over against that figure should be set the descriptions of the young Coleridge by Dorothy Wordsworth and Lamb. And after these, perhaps, the contrast which Coleridge himself draws between his spirit and his body may enable a reader to fuse the two, youth and age, into one. Whatever were the weaknesses of his nature, and the trials of his life, of which one keeps silent. He was deeply loved by friends of many different minds, who, if they grew cold, had paid at least once this tribute to the charm, the gentleness, and the delight of his human companionship. End of section 38section thirty nine of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine section thirty nine Selected Poems by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Kublai Khan 
in xanadu did kubla khan a stately pleasure dome decree where alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea so twice five miles of fertile ground with wall and towers were girdled round and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery but oh that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover a savage place as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover and from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing a mighty fountain momently was forced amid whose swift half intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river five miles meandering with amazing motion through wood and dale the sacred river ran then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean and mid this tumult kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war the shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once i saw it was an abyssinian maid and on her dulcimer she played singing of mount abora could i revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight twould win me that with music loud and long i would build that dome in air that sunny dome those caves of ice and all who heard should see them there and all should cry beware beware his flashing eyes his floating hair weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread for he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise the albatross from the rhyme of the ancient mariner with sloping masts and dripping pro as who pursued with yell and blow still treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head the ship drove fast loud roared the blast and southward i we fled and now there came both mist and snow and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald and through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen nor shapes of men nor beast we keen the ice was all between the ice was here the ice was there the ice was all around it cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound at length did cross an albatross through the fog it came as if it had been a christian soul we held it in god's name it ate the food it ne'er had eat and round and round it flew the ice did split with a thunder feet the helmsman steered us through and a good south wind sprung up behind the albatross did follow and every day for food or play came the mariners hallo in mist or cloud on mast or shroud it perched for vespers nine whilst all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moonshine god save thee ancient mariner from the fields that plague thee thus why look'st thou so with my crossbow I shot the albatross. The sun now rose upon the right, out of the sea came he, still hid in mist, and on left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came the mariners hallo. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work em woe, for all a bird I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, they said, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow nor dim nor red like god's own head the glorious sun uprist then all averred i had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist twas right said they such birds to slay 
that bring the fog and mist the fair breeze blew the white foam flew the furrows followed free we were the first that ever burst into that silent sea down dropped the breeze the sails dropped down twas sad as sad could be and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea all in a hot and copper sky the bloody sun at noon right up above the mast did stand no bigger than the moon day after day day after day we stuck nor breath nor motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean water water everywhere and all the boards did shrink water water everywhere nor any drop to drink the very deep did rot o oh, christ that ever this should be yea slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea about about in reel and rout the death fires danced at night the water like a witch's oils burnt green and blue and white and some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so nine fathoms deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow and every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root we could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot ah well a day what evil looks had i from old and young instead of the cross the albatross about my neck was hung time real and imaginary on the wide level of a mountain's head i knew not where but twas some fairy place their pinions ostrich-like for sails outspread two lovely children run an endless race a sister and a brother this far outstripped the other yet ever runs she with reverted face and looks and listens for the boy behind for he alas is blind or rough and smooth with even step he passed and knows not whether he be first or last dejection an ode late late yestreen i saw the new moon with the old moon in her arms and i fear i fear my master dear we shall have a deadly storm ballad of sir patrick spence well if the bard was weatherwise who made the grand old ballad of sir patrick spence this night so tranquil now will not go hence unroused by winds that ply a busier trade than those which mould yon cloud in lazy flakes or the dull sobbing draught that moans and rakes upon the strings of this aeolian lute which better far were mute for lo the new moon winter bright and overspread with phantom light with swimming phantom light o'erspread but rimmed and circled by a silver thread i see the old moon in her lap foretelling the coming on of rain and squally blast and oh that even now the gust were swelling and the slant night shower driving hard and fast those sounds which oft have raised me whilst they awed and sent my soul abroad might now perhaps their wonted impulse give might startle this dull pain and make it move and live a grief without a pang void dark and drear a stifled drowsy unimpassioned grief which finds no natural outlet no relief in word or sigh or tear o oh, lady in this wan and heartless mood to other thoughts by yonder throstle wooed all this long eve so balmy and serene have i been gazing on the western sky and its peculiar tint of yellow green and still i gaze and with how blank an eye and those thin clouds above in flakes and bars that give away their motion to the stars those stars that glide behind them or between now sparkling now bedimmed but always seen yon crescent moon as fixed as if it grew in its own cloudless starless lake of blue i see them all so excellently fair i see nor feel how beautiful they are my genial spirits fail and what can these avail to lift the smothering weight from off my breast it were a vain endeavour though i should gaze for ever on that green light that lingers in the west i may not hope from outward forms to win the passion and the life whose fountains are within 
O lady, we receive but what we give, and in our life alone does nature live. Ours is her wedding garment, ours her shroud, and would we aught behold of higher worth than that inanimate cold world allowed to the poor loveless ever anxious crowd? Ah, from the soul itself must issue forth a light, a glory, a fair luminous cloud enveloping the earth and from the soul itself must there be sent a sweet and potent voice of its own birth of all sweet sounds the life and element o pure of heart thou needst not ask of me what this strong music in the soul may be what and wherein it doth exist this light this glory this fair luminous mist this beautiful and beauty-making power joy virtuous lady joy that ne'er was given save to the pure and in their purest hour life and life's effluence cloud at once and shower joy lady is the spirit and the power which wedding nature to us gives in dower a new earth and heaven undreamt of by the sensual and the proud joy is the sweet voice joy the luminous cloud we in ourselves rejoice and thence flows all that charms our ear or sight all melodies the echoes of that voice all colors of suffusion from that light there was a time when though my path was rough this joy within me dallied with distress and all misfortunes were but as the stuff whence fancy made me dreams of happiness for hope grew round me like the twining vine and fruits and foliage not my own seemed mine but now afflictions bow me down to earth nor care I that they rob me of my mirth. But, oh, each visitation suspends what nature gave me at my birth, my shaping spirit of imagination. For not to think of what I needs must feel, but to be still and patient all I can. And haply by abstruse research to steal from my own nature all the natural man. This was my sole resource, my only plan till that which suits a part infects the whole, and now is almost grown the habit of my soul. Hence viper thoughts that coil round my mind, reality's dark dream. I turn from you and listen to the wind, which long has raved unnoticed. What a scream of agony, by torture lengthened out, that lute sent forth. Thou, wind that ravest without, bare crag or mountain tern or blasted tree, of pine grove whither woodman never clone or lonely house long held the witch's home methinks were fitter instruments for thee mad lutinist who in this month of showers of dark brown gardens and of peeping flowers makest devil's yule with worse than wintry song the blossoms buds and timorous leaves among thou actor perfect in all tragic sounds thou mighty poet e'en to frenzy bold what tells thou now about tis of the rushing of a host in rout with groans of trampled men with smarting wounds at once they groan with pain and shudder with the cold but hush there is a pause of deepest silence and all that noise as of a rushing crowd with groans and tremulous shudderings all is over it tells another tale with sounds less deep and loud a tale of less affright and tempered with delight as outway south had framed the tender lay tis of a little child upon a lonesome wild not far from home but she hath lost her way and now moans low in bitter grief and fear and now screams loud and hopes to make her mother hear tis midnight but small thoughts have i of sleep full seldom may my friend such vigils keep visit her gentle sleep with wings of healing and may this storm be but a mountain birth may all the stars hang bright above her dwelling silent as though they watched the sleeping earth with light heart may she rise gay fancy cheerful eyes joy lift her spirit joy attune her voice to her may all things live from pole to pole their life the eddying of her living soul O simple spirit guided from above, dear lady, friend devoutest of my choice, thus mayest thou ever, evermore rejoice. The Three Treasures Complaint 
how seldom friend a good great man inherits honor or wealth with all his worth and pains it sounds like stories from the land of spirits if any man obtain that which he merits or any merit that which he obtains reproof for shame dear friend renounce this canting strain what wouldst thou have a good great man obtain place titles salary a gilded chain or thrones of courses which his sword has slain greatness and goodness are not means but ends hath he not always treasures always friends the good great man three treasures love and light and calm thoughts regular as infant's breath and three firm friends more sure than day and night himself his maker and the angel death to a gentleman composed on the night after his recitation of a poem on the growth of an individual mind friend of the wise the teacher of the good into my heart have i received that lay more than historic that prophetic lay wherein high theme by thee first sung aright of the foundations and the building up of a human spirit thou hast dared to tell what may be told to the understanding mind revealable and what within the mind by vital breathing secret as the soul of vernal growth oft quickens in the heart thoughts all too deep for words theme hard as high of smiles spontaneous and mysterious fears the first-born they of reason and twin birth of tides obedient to external force and currents self-determined as might seem or by some inner power of moments awful now in thy inner life and now abroad when power streamed from thee and thy soul received the light reflected as a light bestowed of fancies fair and milder hours of youth highly in murmurs of poetic thought industrious in its joy in vales and glens native or outland lakes and famous hills or on the lonely high road when the stars were rising or by secret mountain streams the guides and the companions of thy way of more than fancy of the social sense distending wide the man beloved is man where france in all her town lay vibrating like some becalmed bark beneath the burst of heaven's immediate thunder when no cloud is visible or shadow on the main for thou wert there thine own brows garlanded amid the tremor of a realm aglow amid a mighty nation jubilant when from the general heart of humankind hope sprang forth like a full-born deity of that dear hope afflicted and struck down so summoned homeward thenceforth calm and sure from the dread watch-tower of man's absolute self with light unwaning on her eyes to look far on herself a glory to behold the angel of the vision then last strain of duty chosen laws controlling choice action and joy an orphic song indeed a song divine of high and passionate thoughts to their own music chanted o oh, great bard ere yet that last strain dying awed the air with steadfast eye i viewed thee in the choir of ever enduring men the truly great have all one age and from one visible space shed influence they both in power and act are permanent and time is not with them save as it worketh for them they in it nor less a sacred role than those of old and to be placed as they with gradual fame among the archives of mankind thy work makes audible a linked lay of truth of truth profound a sweet continuous lay not learnt but native her own natural notes ah as i listened with a heart forlorn the pulses of my being beat anew and even as life returns upon the drowned life's joy rekindling roused a throng of pains keen pangs of love awakening as a babe turbulent with an outcry in the heart and fear self-willed that shunned the eye of hope and hope that scarce would know itself from fear sense of past youth and manhood come in vain and all which i had culled in wood walks wild and all which patient toil had reared and all commune with thee had opened out but flowers strewed on my course and borne upon my beard in the same coffin for the self-same grave 
that way no more and ill beseems it me who came a welcomer in herald's guise singing of glory and futurity to wander back on such unhealthful road plucking the poisons of self-harm and ill such intertwined beseems triumphal wreaths strewed before thy advancing nor do thou sage bard impair the memory of that hour of my communion with thy nobler mind pity or grief already felt too long nor let my words import more blame than needs the tumult rose and ceased for peace is nigh where wisdom's voice has found a listening heart amid the howl of more than wintry storms the halcyon hears the voice of vernal hours already on the wing eve following eve dear tranquil time when the sweet sense of home is sweetest moments for their own sake hailed and more desired more precious for thy song in silence listening like a devout child my soul lay passive by the various strain driven as in surges now beneath the stars with momentary stars of my own birth fair constellated foam still darting off into the darkness now a tranquil sea outspread and bright yet swelling to the moon and when o oh friend my comforter and guide strong in thyself and powerful to give strength thy long-sustained song finally closed and thy deep voice had ceased yet thou thyself wert still before my eyes and roundest both that happy vision of beloved faces scarce conscious and yet conscious of its close i sate my being blended in one thought thought was it or aspiration or resolve absorbed yet hanging still upon the sound and when i rose i found myself in prayer ode to georgiana duchess of devonshire on the twenty-fourth stanza in her passage over mount gothard all held the chapel held the platform wild where tell directed the avenging dart with well-strung arm that first preserved his child then aimed the arrow at the tyrant's heart splendor's fondly fostered child and did you hail the platform wild where once the austrian fell beneath the shaft of tell o lady nursed in pomp and pleasure whence learnt you that heroic measure light as a dream your days their circlets ran from all that teaches brotherhood to man far far removed from want from hope from fear enchanting music lulled your infant ear obeisance praises soothed your infant heart emblazonments and old ancestral crests with many a bright obtrusive form of art detained your eye from nature's stately vests that veiling strove to deck your charms divine rich viands and the pleasurable wine were yours unearned by toil nor could you see the unenjoying toiler's misery and yet free nature's uncorrupted child you held the chapel in the platform wild where once the austrian fell beneath the shaft of tell o lady nursed in pomp and pleasure where learnt you that heroic measure there crowd your finely fibred frame all living faculties of bliss and genius to your cradle came his forehead wreathed with lambent flame and bending low with godlike kiss breathed in a more celestial life but boasts not many a fair come peer a heart so sensitive to joy and fear and some perchance might wage an equal strife some few to nobler being wrought co-rivals in the nobler gift of thought yet these delight to celebrate laurel war and plumy state or in verse and music dress tales of rustic happiness pernicious tales insidious strains that steal the rich man's breast and mock the lot unblessed the sordid vices and the abject pains which evermore must be the doom of ignorance and penury but you free nature's uncorrupted child you held the chapel and the platform wild where once the austrian fell beneath the shaft of tell o lady nursed in pomp and pleasure where learnt you that historic measure you were a mother that most holy name which heaven and nature bless i may not vilely prostitute to those whose infants owe them less than the poor caterpillar owes its gaudy parent to fly you were a mother at your bosom fed the babes that loved you 
you with laughing eye each twilight thought each nascent feeling read which you yourself created o oh, delight a second time to be a mother without the mother's bitter groans another thought and yet another by touch or taste by looks or tones or the growing sense to roll the mother of your infant soul the angel of the earth who while he guides his chariot planet round the goal of day all trembling gazes on the eye of god a moment turned his face away and as he viewed you from his aspect sweet new influences in your being rose bless intuitions and communions fleet with living nature in her joys and woes thenceforth your soul rejoiced to see the shrine of social liberty o beautiful o nature's child twas thence you hailed the platform wild where once the austrian fell beneath the shaft of tell o lady nursed in pomp and pleasure thence learnt you that historic measure the pains of sleep ere on my bed my limbs i lay it hath not been my use to pray with moving lips or bended knees by silently by slow degrees my spirit i to love compose in humble trust mine eyelids close with reverential resignation no wish conceived no thought expressed only a sense of supplication a sense o'er all my soul impressed that i am weak yet not unblessed since in me round me everywhere eternal strength and wisdom are but yesternight i prayed aloud in anguish and in agony upstarting from the fiendish crowd of shapes and thoughts that tortured me a lurid light a trampling throng sense of intolerable wrong and whom i scorn those only strong thirst of revenge the powerless will still baffled and yet burning still desire with loathing strangely mixed on wild or hateful objects fixed fantastic passions maddening brawl and shame and terror over all deeds to be hid which were not hid which all confused i could not know whether i suffered or i did for all seemed guilt remorse or woe my own or others still the same life stifling fear soul stifling shame so two nights passed the night's dismay saddened and stunned the coming day sleep the wide blessing seemed to me distemper's worst calamity the third night when my own loud scream had waked me from the fiendish dream or come with sufferings strange and wild i wept as i had been a child and having thus by tears subdued my anguish to a milder mood such punishments i said were due to natures deeply stained with sin for i untempesting anew the unfathomable hell within the horror of their deeds to view to know and loathe yet wish to do such griefs with such men will agree but wherefore wherefore fall on me to be beloved is all i need and whom i love i love indeed song by glycine a sunny shaft did i behold from sky to earth it slanted and poised therein a bird so bold sweet bird thou wert enchanted he sunk he rose he twinkled he trolled within that shaft a sunny mist his eyes afire his beak of gold all else of amethyst and thus he sang adieu adieu love's dreams prove seldom true the blossoms they make no delay the sparkling dewdrops will not stay sweet month of may we must away far far away to-day to-day youth and age verse a breeze mid blossom strain where hope clung feeding like a bee both were mine life went a main with nature hope and posy when i was young when i was young ah woeful when ah for the change twixt now and then this breathing house not built with hands this body that does me grievous wrong o'er airy cliffs and glittering sands how lightly then it flashed along 
like those trim skiffs unknown of yore on winding lakes and rivers wide that ask no aid of sail or oar that fear no spite of wind or tide not cared this body for wind or weather when youth and i lived in it together flowers are lovely love is flower-like friendship is a sheltering tree oh the joys that came down shower-like of friendship love and liberty ere i was old ere i was old ah woeful ere which tells me youth's no longer here o oh, youth for years so many and sweet tis known that thou and i were one i'll think it but a fond conceit it cannot be that thou art gone thy vesper bell has not yet tolled and thou wert i a masker bold what strange disguise hast thou put on to make believe that thou art gone i see these locks and silvery slips this drooping gait this altered size but springtide blossoms on thy lips and tears take sunshine from thine eyes life is but thought so think i will that youth and i are housemates still phantom or fact author a lovely form there state beside my bed and such a feeding calm its presence shed a tender love so pure from earthly leaven that i aneath the fancy might control twas my own spirit newly come from heaven wooing its gentle way into my soul but ah the change it had not stirred and yet alas that change how fain would i forget that shrinking back like one that had mistook that weary wandering disavowing look twas all another feature look and frame and still methought i knew it was the same friend this riddling tale to what does it belong is t history vision or an idle song or rather say at once within what space of time this wild disastrous change took place author call it a moment's work and such it seems this tale's a fragment from the life of dreams but say that years matured the silent strife and tis a record from the dream of life end of section thirty nine section forty of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 9 section 40 selected poems by william collins william collins 1721 to 1759 there is much to inspire regretful sympathy in the short life of william collins he was born at chichester and received his education at winchester college and at magdalen college oxford a delicate bookish boy he had every stimulus toward a literary career with a fine appreciation of beauty in all forms of art and a natural talent for versification he wrote poems of much promise when very young his persian eclogues appeared when he was only seventeen then colin showed his impatient spirit and fickleness of purpose by deserting his work at oxford in going to london with the intention of authorship his head was full of brilliant schemes too full for with him as with most people conception was always easier than execution but finding it far more difficult to win fame than he anticipated he had not courage to persevere and fell into dissipated extravagant ways which soon exhausted his small means in 1746, he published The Odes, Descriptive and Allegorical, his most characteristic work. They were never widely read, and it took the public some time to appreciate their lyric fervor, their exquisite imagery, and their musical verse. 
in spite of occasional obscurities induced by careless treatment they are among the finest of english odes his love for nature and sympathy with its calmer aspects is very marked speaking of the ode to evening hazlitt says that the sounds steal slowly over the ear like the gradual coming of evening itself according to swinburne the odes do not contain a single false note its grace and vigor its vivid and pliant dexterity of touch he says of the ode to the passions are worthy of their long inheritance of praise but the inheritance did not come at once although collins has always received generous praise from fellow poets his mortified self-love resented lack of success with a legacy bequeathed him by an uncle he bought his book back from the publisher millar and the unsold impressions he burned in angry despair meantime he went on planning works quite beyond his power of execution he advertised proposals for a history of the revival of learning which he never wrote he began several tragedies but his indolent genius would not advance beyond devising the plots as he was always wasteful and dissipated he was continually in debt in spite of his unusual gifts he had not the energy and self-control necessary for adequate literary expression dr johnson who admired and tried to befriend him found a bailiff prowling around the premises when he went to call at his instigation a bookseller advanced money to get collins out of london for which in return he was to translate aristotle's poetics and to write a commentary probably he never fulfilled the agreement indeed he had some excuse a man doubtful of his dinners or trembling at a creditor is not disposed to abstract meditation or remote inquiries comments dr johnson collins was always weak of body and when still a young man was seized by mental disease weary months of despondency were succeeded by madness until he was as dr wharton describes it with every spark of imagination extinguished and with only the faint traces of memory and reason left then the unhappy poet was taken to chichester and cared for by a sister there he who had loved music so passionately hated the cathedral organ in his madness and when he heard it howled in distress among the best examples of his verse besides the poems already mentioned are the dirge to cymbeline ode to fear and the ode on the poetical character which hazlitt calls the best of all how sleep the brave how sleep the brave who sink to rest by all their country's wishes blessed when spring with dewy fingers cold returns to deck their hallowed mould she there shall dress a sweeter sod than fancy's feet have ever trod by fairy hands their knell is rung by forms unseen their dirge is sung there honour comes a pilgrim grey to bless the turf that wraps their clay and freedom shall a while repair to dwell a weeping hermit there the passions when music heavenly maid was young while yet in early greece she sung the passions oft to hear her shell thronged around her magic cell exulting trembling raging fainting possessed beyond the muses painting by turns they felt the glowing mind disturbed delighted raised refined till once to said when all were fired filled with fury rapt inspired from the supporting myrtles round they snatched her instruments of sound and as they oft had heard apart sweet lessons of her forceful art each for madness ruled the hour would prove his own expressive power first fear his hand its skill to try amid the chords bewildered laid and back recoiled he knew not why e'en at the sound himself had made 
next anger rushed in, his eyes on fire and lightnings owned his secret strings in one rude clash he struck the lyre and swept with hurried hand the strings with woeful measures wan despair low solemn sounds his grief beguiled a sullen strange and mingled air twas sad by fits by starts twas wild but thou o oh hope with eye so fair what was thy delighted measure still it whispered promised pleasure and bade the lovely scenes at distant hail still would her touch the strain prolong and from the rocks the wood the vale she called on echo still through all the song and where her sweetest theme she chose a soft responsive voice was heard at every close and hope enchanted smiled and waved her golden hair and longer had she sung but with a frown revenge impatient rose he threw his blood-stained sword and thunder down and with a withering look the war denouncing trumpet took and blew a blast so loud and dread where ne'er prophetic sounds so full of woe and ever and anon he beat the doubling drum with furious heat and though sometimes each dreary pause between dejected pity at his side her soul subduing voice applied yet still he kept his wild unaltered mien while each strained ball of sight seemed bursting from his head thy numbers jealousy to naught were fixed sad proof of thy distressful state of differing themes the varying song was mixed and now it courted love now raving called on hate with eyes upraised as one inspired pale melancholy sat retired and from her wild sequestered seat in notes by distance made more sweet poured through the mellow horn her pensive soul and dashing soft from rocks around bubbling runnels joined the sound through glades and glooms the mingled pleasure stole or o'er some haunted streams with fond delay round and holy calm diffusing love of peace and lonely musing and hollow murmurs died away but oh how altered was its sprightlier tone when cheerfulness a nymph of healthiest hue her bow across her shoulders flung her buskins gemmed with morning dew blue an inspiring air that dale and thicket rung the hunter's call to fawn and dryad known the oak crowned sisters and their chaste eyed queen satyrs and sylvan boys were seen peeping from forth their alleys green brown exercise rejoiced to hear and sport leapt up and seized his beechen spear last came joy's ecstatic trial he with viny crown advancing first to the lively pipe his hand addressed but soon he saw the brisk awakening vial whose sweet entrancing voice he loved the best they would have thought who heard the strain they saw in tempe's veil her native maids amidst the festal sounding shades to some unwearied minstrel dancing while as his flying fingers kissed the strings love framed with mirth a gay fantastic round loose were her tresses seen her zone unbound and he amidst his frolic play as if he would the charming air repay shook thousand odors from his dewy wings o oh, music sphere descended maid friend of pleasure wisdom's aid why goddess why to us denied layest thou thy ancient lyre aside as in that loved athenian bower you learned in all commanding power thy mimic soul o oh, nymph endeared can well recall what then it heard where is that native simple heart devote to virtue fancy art arise as in that elder time warm energetic chaste sublime thy wonders in that godlike age fill thy recording sister's page to said and i believe the tale thy humblest reed could more prevail had more of strength diviner rage 
than all which charms this laggard age e'en all at once together found cecilia's mingled world of sound o bid our vain endeavour cease revive the just designs of greece return in all thy simple state confirm the tales her sons relate to evening if aught of oaten stop or pastoral song may hope chaste eve to soothe thy modest ear like thy own solemn springs thy springs and dying gales o nymph reserved while now the bright-haired sun sits in yon western tent whose cloudy skirts with breed ethereal wove or hang his wavy bed now air is hushed save where the weak-eyed bat with a short shrill shriek flits by on leathern wing or where the beetle winds his small but sullen horn as oft he rises midst the twilight path against the pilgrim born in heedless hum now teach me made composed to breathe some softened strain whose numbers stealing through thy darkening veil may not unseemly with its stillness suit as musing slow i hail thy genial loved return for when thy folding star arising shows his paly circlet at his warning lamp the fragrant hours and elves who slept and buds the day and many a nymph who wreathes her brows with sedge and sheds the freshening dew and lovelier still the pensive pleasure sweet prepare thy shadowy ear then let me rove some wild and healthy scene or find some ruin midst its dreary dells whose walls more awful nod by thy religious gleams or if chill blustering winds or driving rain prevent my willing feet be mine the hut that from the mountain side views wilds and swelling floods and hamlets brown in dim discovered spires and hears their simple bell and marks o'er all the dewy fingers draw the gradual dusky veil while spring shall pour his showers as oft he want and bathe thy breathing tresses meekest eve while summer loves to sport beneath thy lingering light while sallow autumn fills thy lap with leaves or winter yelling through the troublous air affrights thy shrinking train and rudely rends thy robes so long regardful of thy quiet rule shall fancy friendship science smiling peace thy gentlest influence own and love thy favorite name ode on the death of thompson in yonder grave a druid lies where slowly winds the stealing wave the year's best sweets shall duteous rise to deck its poet's sylvan grave and yon deep bed of whispering reeds his airy harp shall now be laid that he whose heart in sorrow bleeds may love through life the soothing shade then maids and youth shall linger here and while it sounds at distance swell shall sadly seem in pity's ear to hear the woodland pilgrims now remembrance oft shall haunt the shore when thames in summer wreaths is dressed and oft suspend the dashing oar to bid his gentle spirit rest and oft is ease and health retire to breezy lawn or forest steep the friend shall view yon whitening spire and mid the varied landscape weep but thou who ownst that earthly bed ah what will every dirge avail or tears which love and pity shed that mourn beneath the gliding sail yet lives there one whose heedless eye shall scorn thy pale shrine glimmering near with him sweet bard may fancy die and joy desert the blooming year but thou lorn stream whose sullen tide no sedge crowned sisters now attend now waft me from the green hill side whose cold turf hides the buried friend and see 
the fairy valleys fade dun night has veiled the solemn view yet once again dear parted shade meek nature's child again adieu the genial meads assigned to bless thy life shall mourn thy early doom their hinds and shepherd girl shall dress with simple hands thy rural tomb long long thy stone and pointed clay shall melt the musing briton's eyes o vales and wild woods shall he say in yonder grave your druid lies end of section forty section forty one of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine section forty one william wilkie collins eighteen twenty four to eighteen eighty nine by charles dudley warner wilkie collins has proved that the charm of a story does not necessarily depend upon the depiction of character or an appeal to the sympathies as he said i have always held the old-fashioned opinion that the primary object of a work of fiction should be to tell a story he also aspired to draw living men and women in which he was less successful count fosco miss gwilt armadale lara fairley and others are indeed distinct but the interest centres not on them but on the circumstances in which they are involved this is the main reason why the critics even in admiring his talent speak of collins with faint depreciation as certainly not one of the greatest novelists of the century although holding a place of his own which forces recognition for novel readers have delighted in his many volumes in spite of the critics and there is a steady demand for the old favorites translated into french italian danish and russian many of them continue to inspire the same interest in foreign lands wilkie collins born january eighth eighteen twenty four did not show any special precocity in boyhood and youth he probably learned much more from his self-guided reading than from his schooling at highbury especially after his acquisition of french and italian during two years in italy in his early teens the influences about him were strongly artistic his father william collins was distinguished as a landscape painter the well-known portrait painter mrs carpenter was his aunt and the distinguished scotch artist david wilkie his godfather but human action and emotion interested him more than art he was very young when he expressed a desire to write and perpetrated blank verse which justified his father in vigorous opposition to his adoption of authorship as a profession so his school days ended he presented the not unusual figure of a bright young englishman who must earn his bread yet had no particular aptitude for doing it he tried business first and became articled clerk with a city house in the tea trade but the work was uncongenial and after a few unsatisfactory years he fell in with his father's views and was entered at lincoln's inn and in due time admitted to the bar although he never practised law he continued writing for amusement however producing sketches and stories valuable as training on his father's death he prepared a biography of that artist in two volumes eighteen forty eight which was considered a just 
as well as a loving appreciation his first novel however was rejected by every publisher to whom he submitted it his second antonina a story of the fall of rome was mediocre he was about twenty-six when he met charles dickens then a man of forty at the height of his fame and with the kindliest feeling for younger writers still struggling for recognition dickens whose own work was always prompted by sympathetic intuition and to whom character development came more easily than ingenious plots cordially admired collins skill in devising and explaining the latter he invited the younger man to become collaborator upon household words and thus initiated a warm friendship which lasted until his own death encouraged by him collins essayed drama and wrote the lighthouse played at gad's hill by distinguished amateurs dickens himself among them at first thought his would seem an essentially dramatic talent and several of his novels have been successfully dramatized but the very cleverness and intricacy of his situations make them unsuited to the stage they are too difficult of comprehension to be taken in at a glance by an average audience in the swift passage of stage action it was also the influence of dickens which inspired collins to attempt social reform in man and wife he tries to show the injustice of scotch marriage laws in the new magdalen the possible regeneration of fallen women in heart and science the abuses of vivisection and other stories are encumbered with didactic purpose mr swinburne comments upon this aspect of his career in a jocular couplet what brought good wilkie's genius nigh perdition some demon whispered wilkie have a mission but in all tendency novels it is not the discussion of problems that makes them live and wilkie collins like others survives by purely literary qualities soon after his death the critic of the spectator gave the following capable summary of his peculiar method he was a literary chess-player of the first force with power of carrying his plan right through the game and making every move tell his method was to introduce a certain number of characters set before them a well-defined object such as the discovery of a secret the revindication of a fortune the tracking of a crime or the establishment of a doubted marriage and then bring in other characters to resist or counterplot their efforts each side makes moves almost invariably well considered and promising moves the counter moves are equally good the interest goes on accumulating till the looker-on the reader is always placed in that attitude is wrapped out of himself by strained attention and then there is a sudden and totally unexpected mate it is chess which is being played and in the best of all his stories the one which will live for years the moonstone the pretense that it is anything else is openly disregarded this analysis however must not be too narrowly construed as petty critics often do to mean that the only interest in mr collins's novels is that of disentangling the plot if this were so no one would read them more than once while in fact the best of them are eminently readable again and again this shallow judgment evidently galled the novelist himself and the new magdalen in one aspect was a throwing down of the gauntlet to the critics for in it he tells the plot page by page almost paragraph by paragraph as he goes along and even far in advance of the story yet it is one of the most fascinating of his novels he proved that he could do admirably what they said he could not do at all make people read his story with breathless absorption when they knew its end 
long before they came to it and it was as interesting backward as forward no name is in some sort a combination of the two methods a revelation of the end with perpetual interest in the discovery of means the moonstone and the woman in white are unquestionably his masterpieces in both he throws light upon a complex plot by means of his favorite expedient of letters and diaries written by different characters who thus take the reader into their confidence and bewilder him with conflicting considerations until the author comes forward with an ingenious and lucid solution the moonstone however is immensely superior in matter even to its fellow its plot is better in one place the woman in white comes to a dead wall which the author calmly ignores and goes on and some passages are worth reading over and over for pure pathos or description mr collins was in fact aside from his special gift a literary artist of no mean power even if not the highest with an eye for salient effects a skill in touching the more obvious chords of emotion a knowledge of life and books that enrich his stories with enough extraneous wealth to prolong their life for many years and some of them perhaps for generations end of section forty one section forty two of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine section forty two the sleepwalking from the moonstone by william wilkie collins this episode is related by the physician in charge of mr franklin blake whose good name he wishes to clear from a charge of fraud two o'clock a m the experiment has been tried with what result i am now to describe at eleven o'clock i rang the bell for betteridge and told mr blake that he might at last prepare himself for bed i followed betteridge out of the room and told him to remove the medicine chest into miss verinder's sitting-room the order seemed to take him completely by surprise he looked as if he suspected me of some occult design on miss verinder might i presume to ask he said what my young lady and the medicine chest have got to do with each other stay in the sitting-room and you will see betteridge appeared to doubt his own unaided capacity to superintend me effectually on an occasion when a medicine chest was included in the proceedings is there any objection sir he asked to taking mr bruff into this part of the business quite the contrary i am now going to ask mr bruff to accompany me downstairs betteridge withdrew to fetch the medicine chest without another word i went back into mr blake's room and knocked at the door of communication mr bruff opened it with his papers in his hand immersed in law impenetrable to medicine i am sorry to disturb you i said but i am going to prepare the laudanum for mr blake and i must request you to be present and to see what i do yes said mr bruff with nine-tenths of his attention riveted on his papers and with one-tenth unwillingly accorded to me anything else i must trouble you to return here with me and to see me administer the dose anything else one thing more i must put you to the inconvenience of remaining in mr blake's room to see what happens 
oh very good said mr bruff my room or mr blake's room it doesn't matter which i can go on with my papers anywhere unless you object mr jennings to my importing that amount of common sense into the proceedings before i could answer mr blake addressed himself to the lawyer speaking from his bed do you really mean to say that you don't feel any interest in what you are going to do he asked mr bruff you have no more imagination than a cow a cow is a very useful animal mr blake said the lawyer with that reply he followed me out of the room still keeping his papers in his hand we found miss verinder pale and agitated restlessly pacing her sitting-room from end to end at a table in a corner stood betteridge on guard over the medicine chest mr bruff sat down on the first chair that he could find and emulating the usefulness of the cow plunged back again into his papers on the spot miss verinder drew me aside and reverted instantly to her one all-absorbing interest the interest in mr blake how is he now she asked is he nervous is he out of temper do you think it will succeed are you sure it will do no harm quite sure come and see me measure it out one moment it is past eleven now how long will it be before anything happens it is not easy to say an hour perhaps i suppose the room must be dark as it was last year certainly i shall wait in my bedroom just as i did before i shall keep the door a little way open it was a little way open last year i will watch the sitting-room door and the moment it moves i will blow out my light it all happened in that way on my birthday night and it must all happen again in the same way mustn't it are you sure you can control yourself miss verinder in his interests i can do anything she answered fervently one look at her face told me i could trust her i addressed myself again to mr bruff i must trouble you to put your papers aside for a moment i said oh certainly he got up with a start as if i had disturbed him at a particularly interesting place and followed me to the medicine chest there deprived of the breathless excitement incidental to the practice of his profession he looked at betteridge and yawned wearily miss verinder joined me with a glass jug of cold water which she had taken from a side table let me pour out the water she whispered i must have a hand in it i measured out the forty minims from the bottle and poured the laudanum into a glass fill it till it is three parts full i said and handed the glass to miss verinder i then directed betteridge to lock up the medicine chest informing him that i had done with it now a look of unutterable relief overspread the old servant's countenance he had evidently suspected me of a medical design on his young lady after adding the water as i had directed miss verinder seized a moment while betteridge was locking the chest and while mr bruff was looking back at his papers and slyly kissed the rim of the medicine glass when you give it to him whispered the charming girl give it to him on that side i took the piece of crystal which was to represent the diamond from my pocket and gave it to her you must have a hand in this too i said you must put it where you put the moonstone last year she led the way to the indian cabinet and put the mock diamond into the drawer which the real diamond had occupied on the birthday night mr bruff witnessed this proceeding under protest as he had witnessed everything else but the strong dramatic interest which the experiment was now assuming proved to my great amusement 
to be too much for betteridge's capacity of self-restraint his hand trembled as he held the candle and he whispered anxiously are you sure miss it's the right drawer i led the way out again with the laudanum and water in my hand at the door i stood to address a last word to miss verinder don't be long in putting out the lights i said i will put them out at once she answered and i will wait in my bedroom with only one candle alight she closed the sitting-room door behind us followed by bruff and betteridge i went back to mr blake's room we found him moving restlessly from side to side of the bed and wondering irritably whether he was to have the laudanum that night in the presence of the two witnesses i gave him the dose and shook up his pillows and told him to lie down again quietly and wait his bed provided with light chintz curtains was placed with the head against the wall of the room so as to leave a good open space on either side of it on one side i drew the curtains completely and in the part of the room thus screened from his view i placed mr bruff and betteridge to wait for the result at the bottom of the bed i half drew the curtains and placed my own chair at a little distance so that i might let him see me or not see me just as the circumstances might direct having already been informed that he always slept with a light in the room i placed one of the two lighted candles on a little table at the head of the bed where the glare of the light would not strike on his eyes the other candle i gave to mr bruff the light in this instance being subdued by the screen of the chintz curtains the window was open at the top so as to ventilate the room the rain fell softly the house was quiet it was twenty minutes past eleven by my watch when the preparations were completed and i took my place on the chair set apart at the bottom of the bed mr bruff resumed his papers with every appearance of being as deeply interested in them as ever but looking toward him now i saw certain signs and tokens which told me that the law was beginning to lose its hold on him at last the suspended interest of the situation in which we were now placed was slowly asserting its influence even on his unimaginative mind as for betteridge consistency of principle and dignity of conduct had become in his case mere empty words he forgot that i was performing a conjuring trick on mr franklin blake he forgot that i had upset the house from top to bottom he forgot that i had not read robinson crusoe since i was a child for the lord's sake sir he whispered to me tell us when it will begin to work not before midnight i whispered back say nothing and sit still betteridge dropped to the lowest depth of familiarity with me without a struggle to save himself he answered by a wink looking next toward mr blake i found him as restless as ever in his bed fretfully wondering why the influence of the laudanum had not begun to assert itself yet to tell him in his present humour that the more he fidgeted and wondered the longer he would delay the result for which we were now waiting would have been simply useless the wiser course to take was to dismiss the idea of the opium from his mind by leading him insensibly to think of something else with this view i encouraged him to talk to me contriving so as to direct the conversation on my side as to lead him back again to the subject which had engaged us earlier in the evening the subject of the diamond i took care to revert to those portions of the story of the moonstone which related to the transport of it from london to yorkshire to the risk which mr blake had run in removing it from the bank at 
frizzing hall and to the expected appearance of the indians at the house on the evening of the birthday and i purposely assumed in referring to these events to have misunderstood much of what mr blake himself had told me a few hours since in this way i set him talking on the subject with which it was now vitally important to fill his mind without allowing him to suspect that i was making him talk for a purpose little by little he became so interested in putting me right that he forgot to fidget in the bed his mind was far away from the question of the opium at the all-important time when his eyes first told me that the opium was beginning to lay its hold upon his brain i looked at my watch it wanted five minutes to twelve when the premonitory symptoms of the working of the laudanum first showed themselves to me at this time no unpractised eye would have detected any change in him but as the minutes of the new morning wore away the swiftly subtle progress of the influence began to show itself more plainly the sublime intoxication of opium gleamed in his eyes the dew of a steady perspiration began to glisten on his face in five minutes more the talk which he still kept up with me failed in coherence he held steadily to the subject of the diamond but he ceased to complete his sentences a little later the sentences dropped to single words then there was an interval of silence then he sat up in bed then still busy with the subject of the diamond he began to talk again not to me but to himself that change told me the first stage in the experiment was reached the stimulant influence of the opium had got him the time was now twenty-three minutes past twelve the next half hour at most would decide the question of whether he would or would not get up from his bed and leave the room in the breathless interest of watching him in the unutterable triumph of seeing the first result of the experiment declare itself in the manner and nearly at the time which i had anticipated i had utterly forgotten the two companions of my night vigil looking toward them now i saw the law as represented by mr bruff's papers lying unheeded on the floor mr bruff himself was looking eagerly through a crevice left in the imperfectly drawn curtains of the bed and betteridge oblivious of all respect for social distinctions was peeping over mr bruff's shoulder they both started back on finding that i was looking at them like two boys caught out by their schoolmaster in a fault i signed to them to take off their boots quietly as i was taking off mine if mr blake gave us the chance of following him it was vitally necessary to follow him without noise ten minutes passed and nothing happened then he suddenly threw the bedclothes off him he put one leg out of bed he waited i wish i had never taken it out of the bank he said to himself it was safe in the bank my heart throbbed fast the pulses at my temples beat furiously the doubt about the safety of the diamond was once more the dominant impression in his brain on that one pivot the whole success of the experiment turned the prospect thus suddenly opened before me was too much for my shattered nerves i was obliged to look away from him or i should have lost my self-control there was another interval of silence when i could trust myself to look back at him he was out of his bed standing erect at the side of it the pupils of his eyes were now contracted his eyeballs gleamed in the light of the candle as he moved his head slowly to and fro he was thinking he was doubting he spoke again how do i know he said 
the indians may be hidden in the house he stopped and walked slowly to the other end of the room he turned waited came back to the bed it's not even locked up he went on it's in the drawer of her cabinet and the drawer doesn't lock he sat down on the side of the bed anybody might take it he said he rose again restlessly and reiterated his first words how do i know the indians may be hidden in the house he waited again i drew back behind the half curtain of the bed he looked about the room with the vacant glitter in his eyes it was a breathless moment there was a pause of some sort a pause in the action of the opium a pause in the action of the brain who could tell everything depended now on what he did next he laid himself down again on the bed a horrible doubt crossed my mind was it possible that the sedative action of the opium was making itself felt already it was not in my experience that it should do this but what is experience where opium is concerned there are probably no two men in existence on whom the drug acts in exactly the same manner was some constitutional peculiarity in him feeling the influence in some new way were we to fail on the very brink of success no he got up again very abruptly how the devil am i to sleep he said with this on my mind he looked at the light burning on the table at the head of his bed after a moment he took the candle in his hand i blew out the second candle burning behind the closed curtains i drew back with mr bruff and betteridge into the farthest corner by the bed i signed to them to be silent as if their lives depended on it we waited seeing and hearing nothing we waited hidden from him by the curtains the light which he was holding on the other side of us moved suddenly the next moment he passed us swift and noiseless with the candle in his hand he opened the bedroom door and went out we followed him along the corridor we followed him down the stairs we followed him along the second corridor he never looked back he never hesitated he opened the sitting-room door and went in leaving it open behind him the door was hung like all the other doors in the house on large old-fashioned hinges when it was opened a crevice was opened between the door and the post i signed to my two companions to look through this so as to keep them from showing themselves i placed myself outside the door also on the opposite side a recess in the wall was at my left hand in which i could instantly hide myself if he showed any signs of looking back into the corridor he advanced to the middle of the room with the candle still in his hand he looked about him but he never looked back i saw the door of miss verinder's bedroom standing ajar she had put out her light she controlled herself nobly the dim white outline of her summer dress was all that i could see nobody who had not known it beforehand would have suspected that there was a living creature in the room she kept back in the dark not a word not a movement escaped her it was now ten minutes past one i heard through the silence the soft drip of the rain and the tremulous passage of the night air through the trees after waiting irresolute for a minute or more in the middle of the room he moved to the corner near the window where the indian cabinet stood he put his candle on the top of the cabinet he opened and shut one drawer after another till he came to the drawer in which the mock diamond was put he looked into the drawer for a moment then he took the mock diamond out with his right hand with the other hand he took the candle from the top of the cabinet 
he walked back a few steps toward the middle of the room and stood still again thus far he had exactly repeated what he had done on the birthday night would his next proceeding be the same as the proceeding of last year would he leave the room would he go back now as i believed he had gone back then to his bedchamber would he show us what he had done with the diamond when he had returned to his own room his first action when he moved once more proved to be an action which he had not performed when he was under the influence of the opium for the first time he put the candle down on a table and wandered on a little toward the farther end of the room there was a sofa here he leaned heavily on the back of it with his left hand then roused himself and returned to the middle of the room i could now see his eyes they were getting dull and heavy the glitter in them was fast dying out the suspense of the moment proved too much for miss verinder's self-control she advanced a few steps then stopped again mr bruff and betteridge looked across the open doorway at me for the first time the prevision of a coming disappointment was impressing itself on their minds as well as on mine still so long as he stood where he was there was hope we waited in unutterable expectation to see what would happen next the next event was decisive he let the mock diamond drop out of his hand it fell on the floor before the doorway plainly visible to him and to every one he made no effort to pick it up he looked down at it vacantly and as he looked his head sank on his breast he staggered roused himself for an instant walked back unsteadily to the sofa and sat down on it he made a last effort he tried to rise and sank back his head fell on the sofa cushions it was then twenty-five minutes past one o'clock before i had put my watch back in my pocket he was asleep it was over now the sedative influence had got him the experiment was at an end i entered the room telling mr Brough and betteridge that they might follow me there was no fear of disturbing him we were free to move and speak the first thing to settle i said is the question of what we are to do with him he will probably sleep for the next six or seven hours at least it is some distance to carry him back to his own room when i was younger i could have done it alone but my health and strength are not what they were i am afraid i will have to ask you to help me before they could answer miss verinder called to me softly she met me at the door of her room with a light shawl and with the counterpane from her own bed do you mean to watch him while he sleeps she asked yes i am not sure enough of the action of the opium in this case to be willing to leave him alone she handed me the shawl and the counterpane why should you disturb him she whispered make his bed on the sofa i can shut my door and keep in my room it was infinitely the simplest and the safest way of disposing of him for the night i mentioned the suggestion to mr bruff and betteridge who both approved of my adopting it in five minutes i had laid him comfortably on the sofa and had covered him lightly with the counterpane and the shawl miss verinder wished us good-night and closed the door at my request we three then drew round the table in the middle of the room on which the candle was still burning and on which writing materials were placed before we separate i began i have a word to say about the experiment which has been tried to-night two distinct objects were to be gained by it the first of these objects was to prove that mr blake entered this room 
and took the diamond last year acting unconsciously and irresponsibly under the influence of opium after what you have both seen are you both satisfied so far they answered me in the affirmative without a moment's hesitation the second object i went on was to discover what he did with the diamond after he was seen by miss verinder to leave her sitting-room with the jewel in his hand on the birthday night the gaining of this object depended of course on his still continuing exactly to repeat his proceedings of last year he has failed to do that and the purpose of the experiment is defeated accordingly i can't assert that i am not disappointed at the result but i can honestly say that i am not surprised by it i told mr blake from the first that our complete success in this matter depended on our completely reproducing in him the physical and moral conditions of last year and i warned him that this was the next thing to a downright impossibility we have only partially reproduced the conditions and the experiment has been only partially successful in consequence it is also possible that i may have administered too large a dose of laudanum but i myself look upon the first reason that i have given as the true reason why we have to lament a failure as well as to rejoice over a success after saying those words i put the writing materials before mr bruff and asked him if he had any objection before we separated for the night to draw out and sign a plain statement of what he had seen he at once took the pen and produced the statement with the fluent readiness of a practised hand i owe you this he said signing the paper as some atonement for what passed between us earlier in the evening i beg your pardon mr jennings for having doubted you you have done franklin blake an inestimable service in our legal phrase you have proved your case betteridge's apology was characteristic of the man mr jennings he said when you read robinson crusoe again which i strongly recommend you to do you will find that he never scruples to acknowledge it when he turns out to have been in the wrong please to consider me sir as doing what robinson crusoe did on the present occasion with those words he signed the paper in his turn mr bruff took me aside as we rose from the table one word about the diamond he said your theory is that franklin blake hid the moonstone in his room my theory is that the moonstone is in the possession of mr lucre's bankers in london we won't dispute which of us is right we will only ask which of us is in a position to put his theory to the test first the test in my case i answered has been tried to-night and has failed the test in my case rejoined mr bruff is still in process of trial for the last two days i have had a watch set for mr lucre at the bank and i shall cause that watch to be continued until the last day of the month i know that he must take the diamond himself out of his banker's hands and i am acting on the chance that the person who has pledged the diamond may force him to do this by redeeming the pledge in that case i may be able to lay my hand on the person and there is a prospect of our clearing up the mystery exactly at the point where the mystery baffles us now do you admit that so far i admitted it readily i am going back to town by the ten o'clock train pursued the lawyer i may hear when i get back that a discovery has been made and it may be of the greatest importance that i should have franklin blake at hand to appeal to if necessary i intend to tell him 
as soon as he wakes that he must return with me to london after all that has happened may i trust to your influence to back me certainly i said mr bruff shook hands with me and left the room betteridge followed him out i went to the sofa to look at mr blake he had not moved since i had laid him down and made his bed he lay locked in a deep and quiet sleep while i was still looking at him i heard the bedroom door softly opened once more miss verinder appeared on the threshold in her pretty summer dress do me a last favour she whispered let me watch him with you i hesitated not in the interest of propriety only in the interest of her night's rest she came close to me and took my hand i can't sleep i can't even sit still in my own room she said oh mr jennings if you were me only think how you would long to sit and look at him say yes do is it necessary to mention that i gave way surely not she drew a chair to the foot of the sofa she looked at him in a silent ecstasy of happiness till the tears rose in her eyes she dried her eyes and said she would fetch her work she fetched her work and never did a single stitch of it it lay in her lap she was not even able to look away from him long enough to thread her needle i thought of my own youth i thought of the gentle eyes which had once looked love at me in the heaviness of my heart i turned to my journal for relief and wrote in it what is written here so we kept our watch together in silence one of us absorbed in his writing the other absorbed in her love hour after hour he lay in deep sleep the light of the new day grew and grew in the room and still he never moved toward six o'clock i felt the warning which told me that my pains were coming back i was obliged to leave her alone with him for a little while i said i would go upstairs and fetch another pillow for him out of his room it was not a long attack this time in a little while i was able to venture back and let her see me again i found her at the head of the sofa when i returned she was just touching his forehead with her lips i shook my head as soberly as i could and pointed to her chair she looked back at me with a bright smile and a charming colour in her face you would have done it she whispered in my place it was just eight o'clock he is beginning to move for the first time miss verinder is kneeling by the side of the sofa she has so placed herself that when his eyes first open they must open upon her face shall i leave them together yes end of section forty two section forty three of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dion gines salt lake city utah library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine section forty three count fosco from the woman in white by william wilkie collins count fosco from the woman in white he looks like a man who could tame anything if he married a tigress instead of a woman he would have tamed the tigress if he had married me i should have made his cigarettes as his wife does i should have held my tongue when he looked at me as she holds hers i am almost afraid to confess it even to these secret pages the man has interested me has attracted me has forced me to like him in two short days he has made his way 
straight into my favorable estimation and how he has worked the miracle is more than i can tell it absolutely startles me now he is in my mind to find how plainly i see him how much more plainly than i see sir percival or mr fairley or walter hartwright or any other absent person of whom i think with the one exception of laura herself i can hear his voice as if he was speaking at this moment i know what his conversation was yesterday as well as if i was hearing it now how am i to describe him there are peculiarities in his personal appearance his habits and his amusements which i should blame in the boldest terms or ridicule in the most merciless manner if i had seen them in another man what is it that makes me unable to blame them or to ridicule them in him for example he is immensely fat before this time i have always especially disliked corpulent humanity i have always maintained that the popular notion of connecting excessive grossness of size and excessive good humor as inseparable allies was equivalent to declaring either that no people but amiable people ever get fat or that the accidental addition of so many pounds of flesh has a directly favorable influence over the disposition of the person on whose body they accumulate i have invariably combated both these absurd assertions by quoting examples of fat people who were as mean vicious and cruel as the leanest and worst of their neighbors i have asked whether henry the eighth was an amiable character whether pope alexander the sixth was a good man whether mr murderer and mrs murderess manning were not both unusually stout people whether hired nurses proverbially as cruel a set of women as are to be found in all england were not for the most part also as fat a set of women as are to be found in all england and so on through dozens of other examples modern and ancient native and foreign high and low holding these strong opinions on the subject with might and main as i do at this moment here nevertheless is count fosco as fat as henry the eighth himself established in my favor at one day's notice without let or hindrance from his own odious corpulence marvellous indeed is it his face that has recommended him it may be his face he is a most remarkable likeness on a large scale of the great napoleon his features have napoleon's magnificent regularity his expression recalls the grandly calm immovable power of the great soldier's face this striking resemblance certainly impressed me to begin with but there is something in him besides the resemblance which has impressed me more i think the influence i am now trying to find is in his eyes they are the most unfathomable gray eyes i ever saw and they have at times a cold clear beautiful irresistible glitter in them which forces me to look at him and yet causes me sensations when i do look which i would rather not feel other parts of his face and head have their strange peculiarities his complexion for instance has a singular sallow fairness so much at variance with the dark brown color of his hair that i suspect the hair of being a wig and his face closely shaven all over is smoother and freer from all marks and wrinkles than mine though according to sir percival's account of him he is close on sixty years of age but these are not the prominent personal characteristics which distinguish him to my mind from all the other men i have ever seen 
the marked peculiarity which singles him out from the rank and file of humanity lies entirely so far as i can tell at present in the extraordinary expression and extraordinary power of his eyes his manner and his command of our language may also have assisted him in some degree to establish himself in my good opinion he has that quiet deference that look of pleased attentive interest in listening to a woman and that secret gentleness in his voice in speaking to a woman which say what we may we can none of us resist here too his unusual command of the english language necessarily helps him i had often heard of the extraordinary aptitude which many italians show in mastering our strong hard northern speech but until i saw count fosco i had never supposed it possible that any foreigner could have spoken english as he speaks it there are times when it is almost impossible to detect by his accent that he is not a countryman of our own and as for fluency there are very few born englishmen who can talk with as few stoppages and repetitions as the count he may construct his sentences more or less in the foreign way but i have never yet heard him use a wrong expression or hesitate for a moment in his choice of words all the smallest characteristics of this strange man have something strikingly original and perplexingly contradictory in them fat as he is and old as he is his movements are astonishingly light and easy he is as noiseless in a room as any of us women and more than that with all his look of unmistakable mental firmness and power he is as nervously sensitive as the weakest of us he starts at chance noises as inveterately as lara herself he winced and shuddered yesterday when sir percival beat one of the spaniels so that i felt ashamed of my own want of tenderness and sensibility by comparison with the count the relation of this last incident reminds me of one of his most curious peculiarities which i have not yet mentioned his extraordinary fondness for pet animals some of these he has left on the continent but he has brought with him to this house a cockatoo two canary birds and a whole family of white mice he attends to all the necessities of these strange favorites himself and he has taught the creatures to be surprisingly fond of him and familiar with him the cockatoo a most vicious and treacherous bird toward every one else absolutely seems to love him when he lets it out of its cage it hops on to his knee and claws its way up his great big body and rubs its top knot against his sallow double chin in the most caressing manner imaginable he has only to set the doors of the canary's cage open and to call them and the pretty little cleverly trained creatures perch fearlessly on his hand mount his fat outstretched fingers one by one when he tells them to go upstairs and sing together as if they would burst their throats with delight when they get to the top finger his white mice live in a little pagoda of gaily painted wire-work designed and made by himself they are almost as tame as the canaries and they are perpetually let out like the canaries they crawl all over him popping in and out of his waistcoat and sitting in couples white as snow on his capacious shoulders he seems to be even fonder of his mice than of his other pets smiles at them and kisses them and calls them all sorts of endearing names if it be possible to suppose an englishman with any taste for such childish interests and amusements as these that englishman would certainly feel rather ashamed of them 
and would be anxious to apologize for them in the company of grown-up people but the count apparently sees nothing ridiculous in the amazing contrast between his colossal self and his frail little pets he would blandly kiss his white mice and twitter to his canary birds amidst an assembly of english fox-hunters and would only pity them as barbarians when they were all laughing their loudest at him it seems hardly credible while i am writing it down but it is certainly true that this same man who has all the fondness of an old maid for his cockatoo and all the small dexterities of an organ-boy in managing his white mice can talk when anything happens to rouse him with a daring independence of thought a knowledge of books in every language and an experience of society in half the capitals of europe which would make him the prominent personage of any assembly in the civilized world this trainer of canary birds this architect of a pagoda for white mice is as sir percival himself has told me one of the first experimental chemists living and has discovered among other wonderful inventions a means of petrifying the body after death so as to preserve it as hard as marble to the end of time this fat indolent elderly man whose nerves are so finely strung that he starts at chance noises and winces when he sees a house spaniel get a whipping went into the stable-yard the morning after his arrival and put his hand on the head of a chained bloodhound a beast so savage that every groom who feeds him keeps out of his reach his wife and i were present and i shall not forget the scene that followed short as it was mind that dog sir said the groom he flies at everybody he does that my friend replied the count quietly because everybody is afraid of him let us see if he flies at me and he laid his plump yellow-white fingers on which the canary birds had been perching ten minutes before upon the formidable brute's head and looked him straight in the eyes you big dogs are all cowards he said addressing the animal contemptuously with his face and the dogs within an inch of each other you would kill a poor cat you infernal coward you would fly at a starving beggar you infernal coward anything that you can surprise unawares anything that is afraid of your big body and your wicked white teeth and your slobbering bloodthirsty mouth is the thing you like to fly at you could throttle me at this moment you mean miserable bully and you daren't so much as look at me in the face because i am not afraid of you will you think better of it and try your teeth in my fat neck bah not you he turned away laughing at the astonishment of the men in the yard and the dog crept back meekly to his kennel ah my nice waistcoat he said pathetically i am sorry i came here some of that brute slobber has got on my pretty clean waistcoat those words express another of his incomprehensible oddities he is as fond of fine clothes as the veriest fool in existence and has appeared in four magnificent waistcoats already all of light garish colours and all immensely large even for him in the two days of his residence at blackwater park his tact and cleverness in small things are quite as noticeable as the singular inconsistencies in his character and the childish triviality of his ordinary tastes and pursuits i can see already that he means to live on excellent terms with all of us during the period of his sojourn in this place he has evidently discovered that laura secretly dislikes him she confessed as much to me when i pressed her on the subject but he has also found out that she is extravagantly fond of flowers whenever she wants a nosegay he has got one to give her 
gathered and arranged by himself and greatly to my amusement he is always cunningly provided with a duplicate composed of exactly the same flowers grouped in exactly the same way to appease his icily jealous wife before she can so much as think herself aggrieved his management of the countess in public is a sight to see he bows to her he habitually addresses her as my angel he carries his canaries to pay her little visits on his fingers and to sing to her he kisses her hand when she gives him his cigarettes he presents her with sugar-plums in return which he puts into her mouth playfully from a box in his pocket the rod of iron with which he rules her never appears in company it is a private rod and is always kept upstairs his method of recommending himself to me is entirely different he flatters my vanity by talking to me as seriously and sensibly as if i was a man yes i can find him out when i am away from him i know he flatters my vanity when i think of him up here in my own room and yet when i go downstairs and get into his company again he will blind me again and i shall be flattered again just as if i had never found him out at all he can manage me as he manages his wife and laura as he manages the bloodhound in the stable-yard as he manages sir percival himself every hour in the day my good percival how i like your rough english humour my good percival how i enjoy your solid english sense he puts the rudest remarks sir percival can make on his effeminate tastes and amusements quietly away from him in that manner always calling the baronet by his christian name smiling at him with the calmest superiority patting him on the shoulder and bearing with him benignantly as a good-humoured father bears with a wayward son the interest which i really cannot help feeling in this strangely original man has led me to question sir percival about his past life sir percival either knows little or will tell me little about it he and the count first met many years ago at rome under the dangerous circumstances to which i have alluded elsewhere since that time they have been perpetually together in london in paris and in vienna but never in italy again the count having oddly enough not crossed the frontiers of his native country for years past perhaps he has been made the victim of some political persecution at all events he seems to be patriotically anxious not to lose sight of any of his own countrymen who may happen to be in england on the evening of his arrival he asked how far we were from the nearest town and whether we knew of any italian gentlemen who might happen to be settled there he is certainly in correspondence with people on the continent for his letters have all sorts of odd stamps on them and i saw one for him this morning waiting at his place at the breakfast-table with a huge official-looking seal on it perhaps he is in correspondence with his government and yet that is hardly to be reconciled either with my other idea that he may be a political exile how much i seem to have written about count fosco and what does it all amount to as poor dear mr gilmore would ask in his impenetrable business-like way i can only repeat that i do assuredly feel even on this short acquaintance a strange half willing half unwilling liking for the count he seems to have established over me the same sort of ascendancy which he has evidently gained over sir percival free and even rude as he may occasionally be in his manner toward his fat friend sir percival is nevertheless afraid as i can plainly see of giving any serious offence to the count i wonder whether i am afraid too 
i certainly never saw a man in all my experience whom i should be so sorry to have for an enemy is this because i like him or because i am afraid of him chi sa as count fosco might say in his own language who knows end of section forty three end of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine